America is the only country in the world, I think, whose leaders insult China. But of all the issues that you mentioned, the most dangerous issue in U.S.-China relations is Taiwan. Has China won? That suggests competition. And one thing I'd like to get clearer on in this conversation is what exactly America and China are competing over and also kind of what they should be competing over. Very good question. And I want to emphasize at the very outset that I speak as a friend of the United States of America. Uh, my wife uh, was born and brought up in Summit, New Jersey, and two of my children live in uh, the U.S. So I'm not anti-American uh, in any way. But at the same time, as a, friend of, as a friend of America, if you see your friend walking towards a cliff, do you tell the friend, keep on walking? Or do you tell the friend, stop, stop, you're going towards a cliff? And that's exactly what America is doing in terms of handling China. Because what Americans don't realize, and, and I'm talking actually of the most liberal, the most thoughtful American intellectuals uh, and, and their perspectives on China, they don't seem to understand that the very idea that a 250-year-old upstart, what were these guys thinking? So what we are seeing today in China is a very natural return of a civilization which over 4,000 years goes for one, 200 years, it goes down. And it has gone down for 150 years. And then it's coming up for another 200 years now. And it's just beginning to come out. And the idea that this civilization, when it wakes up, is going to forget its 4,000-year-old history and say, hey, 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 I want to be like America. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an absolutely stupid assumption that, that completely fogs American thinking on China because the, at the end of the day, one thing that Asians who live in Asia know, that this is an old civilization. It will remain Chinese civilization. It will behave like Chinese civilization and we can get along with it. Okay. But it will let, not become like us. Let, let's, let's stay with this theme a while. I want to get back to the, the question of, of, you know, what America's national interest would seem to suggest about, about the key areas of competition. But uh, on that theme, what do you think uh, from China's perspective, and, and not just the leadership, but I mean the Chinese people's perspective, or maybe those people who support the leadership, which I think Americans may or may not realize is a very large number of Chinese. The leadership has pretty broad only, support. Only 93%. Yeah, yeah. Is that, I, I gather one survey suggested that, uh, gave that kind of number for, and we can, you think we can trust that number? I mean, in other words, this, the survey results aren't influenced by concerns among Chinese that, uh, of what will happen if they express dissent or anything. You think that's a solid number? Well, I think all you have to do is go to China and travel around China. And, you know, for my as part of my research for my book, uh, Has China Won? I spent two months at Fudan University. And, you know, the Chinese people have seen far greater improvement in their lives over the past 30 years or 40 years then they have seen in 3,000, 4,000 years of Chinese history. For the Chinese people, and it's important to remember the bottom 50% through much of Chinese history struggled to eke out a living, you know, really struggled. Okay? And then suddenly all these people now have what? They have houses, they have jobs, their children are getting educated, they get medical care. And you know what? If, if China was really a closed, repressive society, would 139 million leave China freely? <laughs> okay, that's about twice the population of the United Kingdom. And then these stupid people return to China freely. So they, to they what leave. It's supposed to be a repressive society. So they go out on come vacation on. And, and they could, you mean, and they could stay, but they come back. They, they, yeah, in, I mean, in other words, there are people. You, you, it's not like yeah. it's not like the the uh, you know the Berlin Wall. It's not like they're you know the, it's it's like it wouldn't be that hard to leave. They're not leaving. No, they can leave. Anybody can leave China. Yeah. So uh, and, and you 
Except so, now, I mean, COVID, COVID is a problem right. now. So let me let me ask you, if you are, uh, what are the things we do or say by by which I mean America that most annoy them th- that uh, that they think are most unjustified intrusions on uh, I don't know their 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 sovereignty or their uh, their pride or whatever. Well, I think it's important. I want to emphasize that uh, I believe that the United States and China can have a win-win relationship. Absolutely. Where the American people basically are better off and the Chinese people are better off. So that, that, is a, and that is the end goal of my writing. I think it can be done. But of course, it can only be done if you, number one, treat China with respect. You know, America is the only country in the world, I think, whose leaders insult China. In what way? I can tell you, no, no Asian country insults China. What, what do we say that insults China? Just you just have to read uh, the speech that Mike Pompeo gave at the Nixon Library, I think, on the some anniversary of Kissinger's visit in in twenty twenty one. Uh, and, and you can see uh, the, the sort of speeches he gave. Now, twenty twenty. I mean, those sorts of speeches, the condescension, the idea that we're going to liberate the Chinese people, that the Chinese government is illegitimate, that the Chinese government is repressive. You know, yeah. and all these things. And and the point is, if if you really want to engage in a geopolitical contest, and I've been studying geopolitics for over 50 years, since 1971, the first rule of geopolitics is know thine enemy. <laughs> know thine self. Fight a thousand battles, win a thousand battles. And if you completely misunderstand China and you don't understand what its strengths and weaknesses are, then you will lose the fight. Mm. And the Chinese, this is the biggest advantage the Chinese have over the United States of America. The Chinese leaders think long term and have a long term strategy for managing the United States of America. The United States, and as I say in my book, this was told to me, uh, the conversation I had with Henry Kissinger, the United States doesn't have a long term strategy. If you yeah. ask any, any person in the administration, what are you trying to achieve? What is your goal? Let me give you through high, three hypothetical examples overthrow the Chinese Communist Party. Cannot be done. Isolate China. Cannot be done. Stop the Chinese economy from becoming number one. Cannot be done. So what are your objectives? So you have to learn to live with realities. That's what geopolitics is about. And and the United States of America can remain the most admired society in the world even after you, even after China becomes the number one economy. Now that's a possible goal. That's a realistic goal. And that's what United States should try to do. So that, I mean, that takes us back to, in a way, my original question. Uh, you're saying that, that America's national interest lies to some considerable extent in just trying to become a, a, an admirable society, uh, as it long its has been, but not so much recently, I think. I, I mm. mean, uh, now that almost suggests to me that the answer to my original question is that in terms of actual competition with China in a more material sense than that, like competing over Taiwan or competing over the Belt and Road Initiative, right? Like uh, feeling threatened by the Belt and Road Initiative or, uh, or for that matter, uh, you know, the, the issue of uh, the South China Sea, uh, navigation rights, or, or I, you know, who, would, you know, various islands belong to in the South China Sea or the East China Sea. I mean, are you, are you saying those are not, are, are none of those areas that an American president focused on national interests should be concerned about? I'm glad you used the word national interests. Because the first thing you need to do when you engage in a geopolitical competition, like the one the United States has launched against China, there's no question whatsoever 
that the United States has launched a geopolitical contest against China. No question. The trade tariffs, the uh, efforts to set up the Quad, the AUKUS, all uh, the, these are the, actions against China. The Quad being this group of countries, India, Japan, Australia, and the US, right? Exactly. Right. They're all and moved to sort of, in some way or another, constrain China. But of all the issues that you mentioned, the most dangerous issue in US-China relations is Taiwan. Because if there's one issue that can actually lead to war between the United States and China, it is Taiwan. Because there's absolutely no question, and let there be no doubts about this. If Taiwan declares independence and says it wants to become an independent country, China will declare war. There's, it's not 100% certainty, and everyone in Asia knows this. So the best thing we can do is keep the status quo, which preserves autonomy for Taiwan, and that way you avoid a war. South China Sea, there'll be no war. Absolutely You're sure no of that? Because, oh, because, you know, the United States says its primary interest is to protect freedom of navigation in South China Sea. Now, the United States, as you know, is not a claimant to any territories in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be a war, it could be a war between China and the Philippines or China and Vietnam or China and Malaysia, which is unlikely, by the way, and I'll explain why. But uh, in the case of the United States, it says that it has an interest in freedom of navigation. And guess what? The country that has a greater interest then the United States in freedom of navigation is China. <laughs> because China trades more with the world than the United States does. So when the United States Navy keeps international waterways open, it is doing China a massive favor. Although the isn't Chinese there... Actually, th there is an issue uh, over the South China Sea that was taken to an international tribunal, right? And China lost, I gather. And I thought that hmm. was about and, and did not respect the ruling, as I understand it. And I thought that was about something about navigation. That wasn't about the islands, right? Uh, am uh, I it, was, it was about, uh, uh, I don't think it's an island per se. It's, right. it's a f feature, I think. And uh, the Philippines won the case. Right. Right. Uh, and China is not going to respect it. But as you know, most great powers violate international law some of the time, not all oh. the time. And as you know, the United States has a base in Diego Garcia, which the, which the ICJ has declared that the British uh, ownership of the base is illegal and it should be returned to Mauritius. And neither the United States nor UK are going to abide by the World Court ruling. It's not surprising. That's how great powers behave. And so uh, China will not... Uh, abide by the ruling, but China is engaged in intense private discussions with the Philippines to try and find a solution. Okay. And 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 that's what that's what that's what that's how that that's a that's a problem not between United States and China. It's a problem within Philippines and China. Okay. So there's no real issue with freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. It exists and China is not challenging it. China, China would lose more if there's no freedom of navigation. Right. So, okay. And, and um, as for Taiwan, it sounds to me like you're saying the less America talks about it, the better. Because uh, I've had the impression that China would just as soon uh, live with the status quo for quite some time. I mean, its official policy is eventual reconciliation of Taiwan, integration of Taiwan, mm -hmm. Uh, it would say back into you know into China. It, it considers uh, Taiwan to have always been part of China, um, and uh, but uh, you know I, I don't think they want to in, invade Taiwan. And I've wondered whether the amount of rhetorical attention the United States pays to Taiwan, uh, you know, increases the chances of war. Uh, you know, makes it harder. Just arouses various forces that could uh, that could cause trouble. Is that is that your view that that the less America talks about it, the less likely war will be? Well, you know, the one lesson of geopolitics is that when great powers raise human rights issues, 
it is only brought up when it is a convenient geopolitical weapon. So in 1971, when uh, Kissinger went to China, and in 1972, when Nixon went to China, China was in the middle of the Cultural Revolution. The human rights abuses in China under the Cultural Revolution were off the scale. What did the United States do? It didn't see any of it. In fact, for all the years in which the United States collaborated with China, and it collaborated to the extent of uh, putting up CIA listening stations in Xinjiang, by the way, uh, to against the Soviet Union. So today, when the United States expresses concern over Taiwan, to be honest with you, it's not because the United States cares about the people of Taiwan. It's because it's a convenient geopolitical issue to use against China and to say that China is threatening democracy. So that's, I mean, I, I, I don't want to be too cynical, but if tomorrow uh, uh, the United States suddenly decided that China is very important, there's an asteroid coming down, going to, going to hit planet Earth, and the only two countries that can fob it off is United States and China, Taiwan will disappear from the radar. Right. 